Welcome everyone to our video on calculating energy changes during physical changes. In this video, we are going to describe the energy changes that occur when we heat a substance. We're going to define two new terms, heat of fusion and heat of vaporization. Then we're going to calculate the heat transfer during a physical change. Let's start off by looking at a heating curve. On the vertical axis on the heating curve, I have temperature, which is increasing. On the horizontal axis, I have heat added. In this case, it's in joules. So we start, we're starting off with no heat added and we are adding and adding and adding more heat. And as we can see, as we add heat to the substance, the temperature of that substance increases. Now you're familiar with the heating curve from earlier science courses. So you know that a substance doesn't just uh, increase its temperature in a linear ma uh, manner. Let's start off here at point A and describe from point to point what is changing and what's staying the same as we move through the heating curve. So as we move from A to B on this uh, heating curve, this substance is a solid. As the solid is increasing in temperature, those particles are vibrating faster and faster. At some point, and that's point B, the particles are vibrating fast enough that they're starting to overcome slightly some of the intermolecular forces. At this point, we define it as the melting point in which we are transitioning between a solid and a liquid. Now, something interesting happens here from point B to C during the process of melting. We note that even though the graph is progressing to the right, so we're going from 300 joules to 500 joules, the temperature isn't increasing. So if the temperature isn't increasing, the particles aren't increasing in their kinetic energy. But the heat has to go somewhere. So where is it going? Well, it's going to increasing their potential energy. So as the particles get further apart and they're able to rotate, they are increasing in potential energy. At point C, we now have a liquid. And once we have a liquid, the part of the heat now is going again into increasing the kinetic energy of those particles. So those particles are now vibrating and, and rotating faster and faster as we are in a liquid state from C to D. Now D is the point at which those particles now have enough kinetic energy in which they can totally overcome the intermolecular forces of attraction. And once they can break those forces of attraction, they can start to escape into the gas phase. From point D to E is where the substance is breaking all of those intermolecular forces. Now, once again, the temperature is not increasing from D to E, but we still are adding heat. So the heat is going in to breaking those intermolecular forces of attraction. During the boiling process, the particles are not increasing in kinetic energy. They are only increasing in potential energy. Once we hit point E, those particles have now overcome those forces of attraction and are in the gas state. And once again, that extra energy that we're adding can go in to increasing their kinetic energy as we move from E to F. When we have a state change, solid to liquid, liquid to solid, gas to liquid, liquid to gas, the energy, which is either absorbed or released, goes into changing the potential energy of that substance rather than its kinetic energy. During that period of state change, since there's no change in kinetic energy, there is no change in temperature. And therefore, we can't use that Q equals MC delta T equation because the delta T is just going to be zero. 
So we need a different uh, value to use to calculate. Let's start off with the state change between a liquid and a solid. The molar heat of fusion is defined as the amount of heat required to melt or to freeze one mole of a substance. For water, the heat of fusion is 6.02 kilojoules per mole, as in it takes 6.02 kilojoules to melt one mole of water. Note that this positive value here is referencing the specific direction, endothermic, moving from a solid to a liquid. The molar heat of vaporization is the amount of heat required to vaporize or to condense one mole of a substance. For water, that value is 40.7 kilojoules per mole. So it takes 40.7 kilojoules to vaporize or to boil one mole of water. Once again, this positive value is referencing the endothermic direction going from a liquid to a gas. So when we say positive 40.7 kilojoules per mole, that's referencing the energy that needs to be put in to increasing the temperature. Note the difference between the magnitude of the heat of vaporization versus the heat of fusion. The heat of vaporization is much larger because this state change requires totally breaking the intermolecular forces. A very important calculation in thermal chemistry is taking a standardized value like the molar heat of a substance and using that to find out how much heat is going to be released or absorbed when we have some specific amount of that substance. And the form of the equation is always going to be the same. The heat that is going to be released or absorbed is going to be equal to the molar heat, which I've represented with the subscript X, multiplied by the moles that we actually have. Let's go through two examples to end off here to show how we use this equation for molar heat of vaporization and molar heat of fusion. Our first example is this. Determine the amount of heat needed to boil 0.25 moles of water. So we're talking about the process of going from liquid to ga gas, which is vaporization. So let's write out our givens. Now that I've written out my given information, I'll turn that into an equation in which we have heat is equal to the heat of vaporization multiplied by the moles. This is a very straightforward equation. However, we're going to be using this idea where we have some sort of standardized value, so the amount of energy per mole, and need to determine the amount of energy that is changing when we have a specific amount of a substance. So we're gonna be doing this over and over again. So it's very important that you understand what we're doing here conceptually, not just memorizing the formula. So one mole requires 40.7 kilojoules. We have 0 0.25 moles. So we're trying to find out how much heat is going to be required for that smaller amount. So since we have less than one mole, we should expect that the heat is going to be less than 40.7. It's a good thing to check because then if you end up with an answer that's larger than 40.7, you know you most likely divided when you should have multiplied. So we can see that the moles cancel and then we'll end up with a heat value in kilojoules. So 0 0.25 moles of water requires 10.175 kilojoules of heat. Let's now look at an example which requires a few additional steps before we get to the equation. Here's our question for our second example. Determine the amount of heat released or absorbed when one kilogram of water freezes. Before solving this problem, let's identify the direction in which heat is flowing. So here is my heating curve here. And when we think of the heating curve, 
We often think of going from solid to liquid to gas, in which we have to add heat to move from each of those states to another. In this question, water is freezing, so we're going in the opposite direction. We're going from a liquid to a solid. So in this case, heat is going to be released. The heat of fusion is 6.02 kilojoules per mole. Now that is referencing, even though it says fusion here, moving from a solid to a liquid. It's talking about the energy that needs to be put in. When we move, change directions in terms of the energy flow, we need to change the sign as well. So we're going to do that here. So 6.02 kilojoules per mole of water is going to be released when water freezes. Now, in order to find the amount of heat, we need to multiply the heat of fusion by the moles that we have. In this question, I'm given a mass. So let's take the steps now and convert this mass in kilograms to moles. Now that I've converted it to moles, let's substitute our given information into the equation and solve for the heat. So we get an answer with as negative 334.44 kilojoules of heat. Now, when we write this in a statement, what we have to do is be careful about this negative sign. Here's how I would write this final statement. Note that as I write that value as a statement, I omit the negative sign. And that's because the word released is what the negative sign means when we're talking about heat, heat of fusion or heat of vaporization. And you're going to see this coming up over and over again, where we will get energy values that are positive and energy values are negative. We need to interpret that in terms of whether it's talking about an endothermic reaction, an exothermic reaction, whether heat is gained by the surroundings, whether heat is gained by the system. So understanding that is a key idea in thermochemistry.